Section 28 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2, Chapter 6, San Giovanni in Laterano. In the palace on the Aventine, Balthasar stood at a window looking over Rome. The clouds that had hung for weeks over the city cast a dull yellow glow over marble and stone. The air was hot and sultry. Now and then thunder rolled over the Vatican, and a flash of lightning revealed the angel on Castel San Angelo, poised above the muddy waters of the Tiber. A furious, utter dread and terror gripped Balthasar's heart. Days had passed since his defiance of the Pope, and he had heard no more of his daring, but he was afraid, afraid of Michael the Second, of the Church, of heaven behind it, afraid of this woman who had risen from the dead. He knew the number of his enemies and with what difficulty he held Rome. He guessed that the Pope intended his downfall and to put another in his place. But not this almost certain ruin disturbed him day and night. No, the thought that the church might throw him out and consign his soul to the smoky hell. Bravely enough he had dared the Pope at the time when his heart was hot within him, but in the days that followed his very soul had fainted to think what he had done. He could not sleep, nor rest while waiting for outraged heaven to strike. He darkly believed the continual storm brooding over Rome to be omen of God's wrath with him. His trouble was the greater because it was secret, the first that since they had been wedded he had concealed from Isabeau. As this touched her, in an infamous and horrible manner, he could neither breathe it to her nor any other, and the loneliness of his miserable apprehension was an added torture. This morning he had interviewed the envoys from Germany and his chamberlain. Tales of anarchy and turmoil in Rome, of rebellion in Germany, had further distracted him. Now alone in his little marble cabinet, he stared across the gorgeous, storm-wrapped city. Not long ago, he heard someone quietly enter, and because he knew who it was, he would not turn his head. She came up to him and laid her hand on his plain brown doublet. Balthasar, she said, will you never tell me what it is that sits so heavily on your heart he commanded his voice to answer nothing isabeau nothing oh my lord she cried passionately no anguish is so bitter when shared certes you know my troubles isabeau the discontent the factions matter enough to make any man grave and the pope she said raising her eyes to his. Most of all, it is the Pope. His holiness is no friend to me, said the emperor in a low voice. Oh, Isabeau, we were deceived to aid him to the tiara. She shuddered. I persuaded you. Blame me. I was mad. I set your enemy in authority. Nay, he answered in a great tenderness. You are to blame for nothing. You, sweet Isabeau. She saw it, and terror shook her. He said more to you that day than you will tell me, she cried. You fear something that you will not reveal to me. He is a poor knight who tells his lady of his difficulties, he said. I cannot come crying to you like a child. I am very jealous of you, Balthasar, she said thickly. Jealous that you should shut me out from anything. You will know soon enough, he answered, in a hoarse voice, but never from me. Are we not as strong as this man, Balthasar? Nay, he shivered, for he has the church behind him. Tomorrow we shall see him again. I dread tomorrow. Why? she asked thickly. Tomorrow is the feast of the Assumption, and we go to the Basilica. Yea, and the Pope will be there in his power and I must kneel humbly before him, yet not that alone. Balthasar, what do you fear? He breathed heavily. 
nothing a folly an ugly presentiment of late i have slept so little why is he quiet he meditates something his blue eyes widened with fear he put the empress gently from him take no heed sweet i am only weary and your dear solicitude unnerves me i must go pray st joris to remember me angry scorn filled her heart when she considered the reputation this man had won in his youth that indeed he still bore with some yet it could not but stir her admiration to reflect what it must have cost a man of the pope's nature to play the ascetic saint for so many years but his piety had been well rewarded the poor flemish youth sat in the vatican now lord of her husband's fortunes and her own honour then she fell to pondering over the story of ursula of rousselary wondering where she was where she had been these years and how she had met cardinal capriola the empress dwelt on these things till her head ached she was interrupted by the entry of a lady tall and fair leading a beautiful child by the hand jacobia of martzburg and isabeau's son we seek for his grace smiled the lady wenceslas wishes to say his latin lesson and to tell the tale of the three dukes and the sack of gold that he has lately learnt the empress gave her son a quick glance you shall tell it to me wenceslas my lord is not here the boy golden large and glorious to look upon scowled at her the prince tossed his yellow curls i want my father jacobia in pity of the empress's distracted bearing tried to pacify him the empress crushed back the wild misery of her thoughts and caught the child's embroidered yellow sleeve certes ye shall see him she said quietly if he promised you i think he is in the oratory we will wait at the door until he come forth the boy kissed her hand and the shadow passed from his lovely face jacobia saw the empress look down on him with a desperate and heartbroken expression she wondered at the anguish revealed to her in that second but she was neither disturbed nor touched her own heart had been broken so long ago that all emotions were but names to her the empress dismissed her with a glance jacobia left the palace mounted the little byzantine chariot with the blue curtains and drove to the church of san giovanni in laterano she went there every day to hear a mass sung for the soul of one who had died long ago a large portion of her immense fortune had gone in paying for masses and candles for the repose of sibylla one-time wife of sebastian her steward if gold could send the murdered woman there jacobia had opened to her the doors of paradise in her quiet monotonous life in a strange land caring for none and by none cared for with a dead heart in her bosom and leaden feet walking heavily the road to the grave this sibylla had come to be with jacobia the most potent thing she knew neither balthasar nor the empress nor any of their court were so real to her as the steward's dead wife there were a few people in the church kneeling for the angelus jacobia joined them and fixed her eyes on the altar where a strong purple light glowed and flickered bringing out points of gold in the moulding of the ancient arches a deep hush held the scented stillness the scattered bent figures were dark and motionless against the mystic clouds of incense and the soft bright lights monks in long brown habits came and stood in the chancel the bell struck the hour and young novices entered singing angelus domini nuntiavit mariae et concepit de spiritu sancto the monks knelt and folded their hands on their breasts the response that still seemed very sweet to jacobia arose ave 
Maria, gratia plena. A side door near Jacobia opened softly, and a man stepped into the church. A strong sense that the newcomer was observing her made Jacobia turn, almost unconsciously, her head towards him as she repeated the Ave Maria. A tall, richly dressed man was gazing at her intently. His face was in shadow, but she could see long pearls softly gleam in his ears. Priests and novices left the church. The monks filed out and bent figures rose. The man stepped from the shadows as Jacobia rose to her feet, and their eyes met. "'You remember me?' asked Thierry faintly. "'I have forgotten nothing.' she answered calmly. Why do you seek to recall yourself to me? I cannot see you and let you pass. Are you free of the devils? she asked and crossed herself. Thierry winced. He remembered that she believed Dirk was dead, that she thought of the Pope as a holy man. Forgive me, he murmured. For what? Ah, that I did not understand you to be always a saintly woman. Jacobia laughed sadly. You must not think of the past, though you may think of nothing else, even as I do. We might have been friends once, but the devil was too strong for us. At that moment Thierry hated Dirk passionately. He felt he could have been happy with this woman, and with her only in the whole world, and he loathed Dirk for making it impossible. As she moved towards the door, he came beside her. Then, by a common impulse, both stopped. Round one of the dark, glittering pillars, a brilliant figure flashed into the rich light, the masked dancer in orange. She stepped up to Thierry and laid her fingers on his scarlet sleeve. "'How does Thierry of Dendermonde keep his word?' she mocked, and her eyes gleamed from their holes. Is your heart of a feather's weight that it flutters this way and that with every breath of air? What does she mean? asked Jacobia, as the man flushed and shuddered. And what does she hear in this attire? The dancer turned to her swiftly. What of one who drags his weary limbs beneath a Syrian sun in penitence for a deed ye urged him to? she said in the same tone. Jacobia stepped back with a quick cry, and Thierry seized the dancer's arm. Be gone, he said threateningly. I know you, or who you feign to be. She answered between laughter and fear. Let me go. I have not hurt you. Why are you angry, my brave knight? At the sound of her voice, that she in no way lowered, a monk came forward and sternly ordered her from the church. The dancer laughed. So I am flung out of the house of God? Well, sir and sweet lady, will you come to the mass at the basilica tomorrow? Nay, do. It will be worth beholding. The basilica tomorrow. I shall be there. With that, she darted before them and slipped from the church. Man and woman shuddered and knew not why. A peal of thunder rolled. The walls of the church shook, and an image of the Virgin was hurled to the marble pavement and shivered into fragments. End of section 28. Recording by Molly Craig. Section 29 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2. Chapter 7. THE VENGEANCE OF MICHAEL II. From every church and convent in Rome the bells rang out. It was the Feast of the Assumption and holiday in the city. Strange, heavy clouds still obscured the sky, and intermittent thunder echoed in the distance. The Basilica of St. Peter was crowded from end to end. The vast congregation all knelt upon the marble floor, save the emperor and his wife, who sat under a violet canopy placed opposite the pulpit. Between them, on a lower step of the dais, stood their little son, gleaming in white satin and overawed by the glitter and the silence. 
surrounding the throne were ladies courtiers frankish knights members of the council german margraves italian nobles envoys from france spain and resplendent greeks from the court of basil thierry kneeling in the press distinguished the calm face of jacobia of martzburg among the dames of the empress's retinue but he sought in vain through the immense and varied crowd for the dancer in orange a faint chant rose from the sacristy jewelled crosses showed above the heads of the multitude as the monks entered holding them aloft the fresh voices of the choristers came nearer acolytes took their places round the altar and the blue clouds of incense floated over the hushed multitude the bells ceased the rise and fall of singing filled the basilica cardinal orsini followed by a number of priests went slowly down the aisle towards the open bronze doors his brilliant dalmatica shivered into gleaming light as he moved at the doors he paused the pontifical train was arriving in a gorgeous dazzle of color and motion michael the second stepped from a gilt car drawn by four white oxen whose polished horns were wreathed with roses white and red preceded by cardinals the vivid tints of whose silk robes burnt in the golden brightness of the basilica the pope passed down the aisle while the congregation crouched low on their knees and hid their faces emperor and empress rose he looked at his son but she at the pontiff who took no heed of either monks priests and novices moved away from the high altar where the rows upon rows of candles shone like stars against the sparkling incense-laden air he passed to his gold and ivory seat and the cardinals took their places beside him the empress put her hand over her eyes her jewels seemed so heavy they must drag her from the throne the crown galled at her brow. The little Wenceslas stood motionless, a bright color in his cheeks, his eyes brilliant with excitement. Now and then the emperor looked at him in a secretive, piteous manner. There was an involuntary stir among the people as the rich voices of the men took up the singing at the end of the epistle, a movement of joy, of pleasure in the triumphant music. Then the pope moved descended slowly from the dais and mounted the steps of the high altar his train upheld by two archbishops emperor and empress knelt with the rest as he performed the office of the mass and intense stillness held the rapt assembly but as he turned and displayed the host before the vast multitude who hid their eyes as he held it like a captured star above the hushed splendor of the altar a crash of thunder shook the very foundations of the church and the walls shivered as if mighty forces beat on them without michael the second the only man erect in the crouching multitude smiled slowly as he replaced the eucharist lightning darted through the high colored windows and quivered a moment before it was absorbed in the rich lights down the chancel came a tall monk in the robe of the order of the black penitents his arms were folded his hands hidden in his sleeves his deep cowl cast his face into utter shadow i thought cardinal colonna preached whispered balthasar fearfully as the monk ascended the pulpit i know not this man the monk drew from his sleeve a parchment from which swung a mighty seal slowly he unfurled it the empress crouched closer to balthasar the monk began to speak and both to Isabeau and her husband the voice was familiar, a voice that had been long silent in death. In the name of Michael the Second, servant of servants of God and vicerant of Christ, I herewith pronounce the anathema over Balthasar of Courtrai, Emperor of the West, over Isabeau, born Morosia Porphyrogenitus, over their son Wenceslas over their followers servants and hosts i herewith expel them from the pale of holy church and curse them as heretics i forbid any to offer them shelter food or help 
I hurl on their heads the wrath of God and the hatred of man. I forbid any to attend their sick bed, to receive their confession, or to bury their bodies. I cut asunder the ties that bind the Latin people in obedience to them. And I lay under and interdict any person, village, town, or state that succors or aids them against our wrath. May they and their children and their children's children be blighted and cursed in life, and in death may they taste misery and desolation on the earth before they go to everlasting torment in hell. And now the cowled monk caught up one of the candles that lit the pulpit and held it aloft. May their race perish with them, and their memories be swallowed in oblivion. Thus, as I extinguish this flame, may the hand of God extinguish them. He cast the candle on to the marble floor beneath the pulpit. The flame was immediately dashed out. A slow smoke curled an instant and vanished. For Balthasar of Courtraig cherishes a murderess on the throne, and until he cast her forth and receive his true wife, this anathema rests upon his head emperor and empress listened holding each other's hands and staring at the monk as he ended and while the awe of utter fear held the assembly numb isabel rose but at that same instant the monk tossed back his cowl and revealed the stern pale features of melchior of brabant crowned with the imperial diadem a frenzied shriek broke from the woman, and she fell across the steps of the throne. Her crown slipped from her fair head and dazzled up on the pavement. Groaning in anguish, Balthasar stood to raise her up. When he again looked at the pulpit, it was empty. Isabeau's cry had loosened the souls of the multitude. They rose to their feet and began to surge wildly towards the door. But the pontiff rose approached the altar, and began calmly to chant the gratias. Balthasar gave him a wild and desperate look, staggered and fiercely recovered himself, then took his child by the hand, and supporting with the other the empress, who struggled back to life, he swept down the aisle, followed by a few of his German knights. The people shuddered away to right and left to give him passage. The bronze doors were opened, and the excommunicated man stepped into the thunder-wrapped streets of the city where he no longer reigned. End of section 29. Recording by Molly Craig. Section 30 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2. Chapter 8. Ursula of Rousselary say i have done well for you it seems that i must ask your thanks the pope sat at a little table near the window of his private room in the vatican and rested his face on his hand leaning against the scarlet tapestries that covered the opposite wall was thierry clothed in chain mail and heavily armed yea answered thierry and is it for my sake ye have done this must you question it returned michael with a quick breath yea for your sake to make you as i promised emperor of the west my vengeance had else been more quietly satisfied he laughed i have not forgotten all my magic thierry winced the vision in the basilica was proof of that what are you who can bring back the hallowed dead to aid your schemes do you think i am not human thierry he gave a sigh if you would believe in me trust me be faithful to me why our friendship would be the lever to move the universe and you and i would rule the world between us but this is truth if again you forsake me you bring about your own downfall stand by me and i will share with you the dominion of this earth this i say is truth thierry laughed unhappily <laughs> sweet devil there is no god and i have no soul there do not fear i shall be very faithful to you since what is there for man save to glut his desires of pomp and wealth and power he moved from the wall and took a quick turn about the room 
and yet i know not he cried can all your magic all your learning all your riches keep you where you are the clouds hang angrily over rome nor have they lifted since orsini announced you pope the people riot in the streets all beautiful things are dead many see ghosts and devils walking at twilight across the maremma the powers that put me here can keep me here be you but true to me eh i will be emperor thierry grasped his sword hilt fiercely though the world i rule wrought about me though ghouls and fiends make my imperial train i will join hands with antichrist and see if there be a god or no the pope rose you must go against balthasar you must defeat his hosts and bring to me his empress then will i crown you in st peter's thierry pressed his hand to his forehead we start to-morrow with the dawn beneath the banner of god his church i in this mail ye gave me tempered and forged in hell until then stay in the vatican said michael the second suddenly my prelates and my nobles know you for their leader now nay thierry flushed as he answered i must go to my own abode in the city jacobia of martzburg is still in rome said the other do you leave me to go to her what is jacobia to me demanded thierry desperately why did you approach her after her devotions in san giovanni in laterano speak to her and recall yourself to her mind you know that ah it was the dancer your accomplice what mystery is this he asked in a distracted way why does not ursula of rousselary come forth under her true name and confound the emperor why does she follow me and in such a guise without looking at him michael answered maybe because she is very wise maybe because she is a very fool let her pass she has served her turn you say you do not go to palter with jacobia then farewell until to-morrow i have much to do farewell thierry thierry left the rich scented chamber and the vast halls of the vatican and passed into the riotous and lawless streets of rome the storm that had hung so unnaturally long over the city had affected the people bravos and assassins crept from their hiding places in the catacombs or the palatine and flaunted in the streets the wine shops were filled with mongrel soldiers of all nations attracted by the declaration of war from the surrounding towns blasphemers mocked openly at the processions of monks and pilgrims that traversed the streets chanting the penitential psalms or scourging themselves in an attempt to avert the wrath of heaven witches gathered in the low marshes of the maremma and came at night into the city trailing gray fever-laden vapor after them the bell-ropes began to rot in the churches and the bells clattered from the steeples the gold rusted on the altars and mice gnawed the garments on the holy images of the saints the people lived with reckless laughter and died with hopeless curses and such under pope michael the second was rome swiftly and in a moment thierry like all others went heavily armed his hand was constantly on his sword hilt as he made his way through the city that was forsaken by god thierry walked beyond the appian gate and stopped at a low convent building above the portals of which hung a lamp its gentle radiance like a star in the heavy noisome twilight the gate that led into a courtyard stood half open thierry softly pushed it wider and entered there were no lights in the convent windows but it was not yet too dark for thierry to distinguish the slim figure of a lady seated on a wooden bench her hands passive in her lap he latched the gate and softly crossed the lawn you said that i might come jacobia turned her head unsmiling unsurprised eh sir this place is open to all he seated himself beside her what do you do here he asked so little there are two sisters here and i help them one can do nothing against the plague but for the little forsaken children something and something for the miserable sick the wretched of rome are not in your keeping he said eagerly it will mean your life 
why did you not go with the empress she shook her head i was not needed i suppose what they said of her was true i cannot remember it clearly but i think that when melchoir died i knew it was her doing we must not dwell on the past said thierry have you heard that i lead the pope's army against balthasar nay her eyes were on the white rose jacobia i shall be the emperor in the now complete dark they could scarcely see each other there were no stars and distant thunder rolled at intervals thierry timidly put out his hand and touched the fold of her dress where it lay along the seat i wish you would not stay here it is so lonely i think she would wish me to do this she he questioned sibylla she is dead yea she died on a cold morning it was so cold you could see your breath before you as you rode along and the road was hard as glass there was a yellow dawn that day and the pine trees seemed frozen they stood so motionless you would not think it was ten years ago i wonder how long it seems to her a silence fell upon them for a while then thierry broke out desperately jacobia my heart is torn within me to-day i said there was no god but when i sit by you yea there is a god she answered quietly be very sure of that oh jacobia he cried at last i am beyond all measure mean and vile i know not what to do i can be emperor yet as i sit here that seems to me as nothing jacobia rose slowly from the bench why do you come to me because ye seem to me nearer heaven than anything i know he followed her dim seen figure across the grass she lifted the latch of the convent door and went before him into the building for a while she left him in the passage then returned with a pale lamp in her hand and conducted him into a small bare chamber which seemed mean in contrast with the glowing splendour of his appearance the sisters are abroad said jacobia and i stay here in case any ring the bell for succour she set her lamp on the wooden table and slowly turned her eyes on thierry sir i am very selfish she spoke with difficulty as if she painfully forced expression i have thought of myself for so many years and somehow she lightly touched her breast i cannot feel for myself or for others nothing seems real save sibylla nothing matters save her sometimes i cry for little things i find dying alone for poor unnoticed miseries of animals and children but for the rest you must not blame me if i do not sympathize that has gone from me nor can i help you god is far away beyond the stars i do not think he can stoop to such as you and me and and i do not feel as if i should wake until i die thierry covered his eyes and moaned jacobia was not looking at him but at the one bright thing in the room a samite cushion worked with a scarlet lily that rested on a chair by the window she took her gaze from the red flower and turned her tired gray eyes on him the blood surged into his face he clenched his hands and spoke passionately i will renounce the world i will become a monk what was that asked jacobia one was singing without thierry's strained eyes glistened if love were all his perfect servant i would be kissing where his foot might fall doing him homage on a lowly knee if love were all thierry turned and went out into the dark hot night he could see neither roses nor fountain nor even the line of the convent wall against the sky but the light above the gate revealed to him the dancer in orange who leant against the stone arch of the entrance and sang to a strange long instrument that hung round her neck by a gleaming chain at her feet the ape crouched nodding himself to sleep what do you do here he demanded fiercely the pope spy you may i not come to worship here as well as another she answered 
he caught her by the arms and held her against the stone gateway now tell me the meaning of your disguise he breathed and of your league with michael the second she said a strange little word under her breath the ape jumped up and tore away the man's hands while the girl bent to a run and sped through the gate thierry gave a cry of pain and rage and glanced towards the convent the door was closed lady and lamp had disappeared in the darkness shut out whispered thierry shut out he turned into the street and saw by the scattered lanterns along the appian way the figure of the dancer slipping fast towards the city gates but he gained on her and at the sound of his clattering step she looked round ah she said i thought you had stayed with the sweet-faced saint yonder she wants none of me he panted but i i mean to see your face to-night i am not beautiful answered the dancer and you have seen my face seen your face certes in the basilica on the fete the ever-gathering tempest was drawing near with fitful flashes of lightning playing over his jewel-like mail and her orange gown as they made their way through the ruins do you wander here alone at night asked thierry it is a vile place a man might be afraid i have the ape she said where are we going asked thierry the wayside lanterns had ceased he could see her only by the lightning gleams i know not why do you follow me i am mad i think the earth rocks beneath me and heaven bends overhead you lure me and i follow in sheer confusion ursula of rousselary why have you lured me what power is it that you have over me wherefore are you disguised i am balthasar's wife ay he responded eagerly and i do hear ye loved another man what is that to you she asked this though i have not seen your face perchance i could love you ursula there was no answer he felt her arm quiver under his hand and heard the hems of her tunic tinkle against her buskins as if she trembled at last she spoke in a half swooning voice i have taken off my mask bend your head and kiss me invisible and potent powers drew him towards her unseen face his lips touched and kissed its softness the thunder sounded with such a terrific force and clash that thierry sprang back a cry of agony went up from the darkness he ran blindly forward her presence had gone from his side nor could he see or feel her as he moved he ran sobbing down the appian way and his pace was very swift for all the mail he carried end of section 30 Recording by Molly Craig Section 31 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2 Chapter 9 Pope and Empress The Pope walked in the garden of the Vatican. Behind him, Cardinal Orsini and Cardinal Colonia. Both talked of the horrible state of Rome, of the unending storm hanging over the capital, of the army that had gone forth three days ago to crush the excommunicated emperor. Michael the Second was silent. He wore a white robe, his soft, heavy red hair showing a brilliant color above it. His dark eyes were thoughtful, his pale mouth resolutely set. The cardinals fell further behind and conversed with the greater ease suddenly the pope paused and stood waiting for paolo orsini with a sprig of pink flower at his chin was coming across the lawn michael the second tapped his gold-shod foot on the marble path what is it orsini your holiness a lady who will neither unveil nor give her name has obtained entry to the vatican and desires to see your holiness michael the second reflected a moment his slim fingers pulling at the laurel leaves beside him we will see her he said at length bring her here orsini the yellow clouds broke over a brief spell of sunshine that fell across the vatican gardens though the horizon was dark with a freshly gathering storm 
Michael II seated himself on a bench where the sun gleamed. Sirs, he said to the two cardinals, stand by me and listen to what this woman may say. And picking a crimson rose from a thorny bush that brushed the seat, he considered it curiously, and only took his eyes from it when Paolo Orsini had returned, and led the lady almost to his feet. Then he looked at her. She wore a dark rough dress, showing marks of ill usage, and over her face a thick veil. This she loosened as she knelt, and revealed the exceedingly fair, sad face of Isabel the Empress. Michael the Second went swiftly pale. He fixed large eyes on her. "'What do you hear, defying us?' he demanded. She rose. "'I am not here in defiance. I have come to give myself up to punishment for the crime you denounced, the crime for which my lord now suffers. It did not occur to your holiness, she added, facing him fearlessly, that I should do this. You thought that he would never give me up, and you were right. Crown, life, heaven he would forfeit for love of me, but I will not take the sacrifice. At last Michael spoke. Ye slew Malquar of Brabant, ye confess it? Her bosom heaved. I am here to confess it. For love of Balthasar you did it? As for love of him, I stand here now to take the consequences. The Pope cast the crushed rose from him. Has Balthasar sent you here? She smiled proudly. I come without his knowledge. Her voice trembled a little. I left a writing telling him where I had gone and why. Her hand crept to her brow. Enough of that. Michael the Second rose. Why have you done this? he cried angrily. Isabeau answered swiftly, that you may take the curse off him. For my sin you cast him forth. Well, if I leave him, if I accept my punishment, if he be free to find the woman, who can claim him, your holiness must absolve him of the excommunication. Had you told him to his face of your crime, would he have given you over to our wrath? Nay, she flashed, it would have been only noble in him to refuse. But since of myself I have come, I pray you, Lord Pope, to send me to death and take the curse off him. Michael the Second looked at his hand. The stem of the red rose had scratched his finger, and a tiny drop of blood showed on the white flesh. "'You are a wicked woman by your own confession,' he said, frowning. "'Why should I show you any pity?' "'I do not ask pity, but justice for the emperor. I am the cause of the quarrel, and now ye have me, ye can have no bitterness against him.' He gave her a quick, sidelong look. Do you repent, Isabeau? She shook the clinging hood free of her yellow hair. No, the gain was worth the sin, nor am I afraid of you nor heaven. I am not of a faltering race, nor of a name easily ashamed. In my own eyes I am not abashed. Michael raised his head and their eyes met. So you would die for him? When I was a child I was taught that they who live as kings and queens must not look for age. The flame soon burns away, leaving the ashes. And gorgeous years are like the flame. Why should we taste the dust that follows? I have lived my life. He answered, This shall not save Balthasar, nor take our curse from off him. Thierry of Dendermonde has gone forth with many men and banners and soon the Roman gates shall open to him and victory lead his charger through the streets. And his reward shall be the Latin world, his badge of triumph, the imperial crown. He is our choice to share with us the dominion of the West. Therefore, no more of Balthasar. Ye might speak until the heavens fell, and still our hearts be as brass. He turned swiftly and caught the arm of Cardinal Orsini. Away, my lord! We have given this Greek time enough. She clutched in her desperation at the priest's white garments. Show some pity. Balthasar dies beneath your wrath. 
Take her away, said Michael. Cast her from Rome. He glared at her over his shoulder. Doubtless the eastern she-cat will find it worse so to die than as Hugh of Rousselerie perished. Come on, my lords. This, your Christian priest? she cried hoarsely, starting after the white figure. Then, as she saw the guards approaching, she fell into an utter silence. As Michael II entered the Vatican, the sun was again obscured, and the thunder rolled. He passed up the silver stairs to his cabinet, and closed the door on all. The storm grew and rioted angrily in the sky. In the height of it came a messenger riding straight to the Vatican. Blood and dust were smeared on his clothes, and he was weary with swift travel. They brought him to the ebony cabinet and face to face with the Pope. From Thierry of Dendermonde, your holiness. What says he? Victory? Balthasar of Courtreg is defeated. His army lies dead, men and horses, in the Vale of Tivoli, and his conqueror marches home today. A shaft of lightning showed the ghastly face of Michael the Second, and a peal of thunder shook the messenger back against the wall. End of section thirty one. Recording by Molly Craig. Section thirty two of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part two. Chapter ten. Evening before the coronation. The orange marble pillars glowing in the light of a hundred lamps gave the chamber a dazzling brightness. The windows were screened by scarlet silk curtains and crystal bowls of purple flowers stood on the serpentine floor. On a low gilt couch against the wall sat Thierry, his gold armor half concealed by a violet and ermine mantle. Round his close dark hair was a wreath of red roses, and the long pearls in his ears glimmered with his movements. Opposite him on a throne supported by basalt lions was Michael the Second, robed in gold and silver tissues under a dalmatica of orange and crimson brocade. It is done, he said in a low, eager voice, and tomorrow I crown you in St. Peter's Church. Thierry, it is done. Truly our fortunes are marvelous, answered Thierry. Today, when I heard the princes elect me, an unknown adventurer, when I heard the mob of Rome shout for me, I thought I had gone mad. Are you afraid of me? the other asked. Why do you so seldom look at me? Thierry slowly turned his beautiful face. I am afraid of my own fortunes. I am not as bold as you, he said fearfully. You never hesitated to sin. The Pope moved, and his garments sparkled against the gleaming marble wall. I do not sin, he smiled. I am sin. I do no evil, for I am evil. But you, his face became grave, almost sad. You are very human. Better it had been for me never to have met you. Thierry, for your sake I have risked everything. For your sake, maybe, I must leave this strange, fair life and go back whence I came. So much I care for you. So dearly have I kept the vows we made in Frankfurt. Cannot you meet with courage the destiny I offer you? Was not your blood warmed by that charge at Tivoli, when knight and horse fell before your spears and your host humbled an emperor, when Rome rose to greet you, and I came to meet you with a kingdom for a gift? Did not some fire creep into your veins that might serve to heat you now? A kingdom, cried Thierry, the kingdom of Antichrist. The victory was not mine. The cohorts of the devil galloped beside us and urged us to unholy triumph. Rome is a place of horror, full of witches, ghosts, and strange beasts. You said you would be emperor, answered the Pope, and I have granted you your wish. If you fail me or betray me now, it is over for both of us. Thierry stopped in his pacing to and fro. 
why do you say to me so often do not fail me do not betray me michael the second answered in a low voice because i fear it thierry laughed desperately to, to whom should i betray you it seems that you have all the world there is jacobia of martzburg why do you sting me with that name belike i thought ye might wish to make her your empress said the pope in sudden mockery thierry pressed his hand to his brow she believes in god what is that to me he cried the other day you lied to me saying you knew not where she was and straightway ye visited her this is your spy's work ursula of rousselary she will not trouble you again answered michael the second let her go i cannot she said i have seen her face well if you have take it from me she is not fair i do not think of her fairness answered thierry sullenly but of the mystery there is behind all of it why you never told me of her before and why she haunts me with witches in her train the pope looked at him curiously for one who has never been an ardent lover ye dwell much on women i had rather you thought on battles and kingdoms had i been a were i you dancer and nun alike would be nothing to me compared with my coronation on the morrow would ye had never come my way to be my ruin and your own would you were not such a sweet fair fool that i must love you and so we make ourselves the mock of destiny by these complaints oh if you have the desire to be king show the courage to dare a kingly fate you must think me a coward thierry said and i have been very weak but that i think is past i have reached the summit of all the greatness i ever dreamed and it confuses me but when the imperial crown is mine you shall find me bold enough then are we great indeed we shall join hands across the fairest dominion men ever ruled swabia is ours bohemia and lombardy france courts our alliance cyprus the isle of candy and malta town in rhodes they worship us and genoa town owns us master he paused in his speech and stepped down from the throne do you remember that day in antwerp thierry when we looked in the mirror he said and his voice was tender and beautiful we hardly dared then to think of this we saw a gallows in that mirror answered thierry a gallows tree beside the triple crown it was for our enemies cried michael our enemies whom we have triumphed over thierry think of it we were very young then and poor now i have kings at my footstool and you will sleep to-night in the gold palace of the aventine he laughed joyously thierry's face grew gentle at the old memories the house still stands i wot he mused though the dust be thick over the deserted rooms and the vine chokes the windows when i was in the east i have thought with great joy of antwerp the pope laid his delicate fragrant hand on the glittering vambrace thierry do you not value me a little now you have done more for me than man or god and above both i do worship you he answered i am not fearful any more and to-morrow ye shall see me a king indeed until to-morrow then farewell i must attend a conclave of the cardinals and show myself unto the multitude in st peter's church you to the palace on the aventine there to sleep soft and dream of gold they clasped hands a hot color was in the pope's face the syrian guards wait below and the lombard archers who stood beside you at tivoli they will attend you to the imperial palace what shall i do there asked thierry it is early yet and i do not love to sit alone then come to the service in the basilica come with a bold bearing and a rich dress to overawe these mongrel crowds of rome to that thierry made no answer the pope came quickly to his side 
do not go to jacobia to-night he said earnestly remember if you fail me now i shall not fail you or myself again farewell thierry descended the stairs and now and then looked up always to see fixed on him the yearning fierce gaze of the one who stood by the gilded rails and stared down at his glittering figure only when he had completely disappeared in the turn of the stairs did michael the second slowly return to the golden chamber and close the gorgeous doors thierry splendidly attended flashed through the riotous streets of rome to the palace on the aventine hill there he dismissed the knights i shall not go to the basilica to-night he said go thou there without me he laid aside the golden armor the purple cloak and attired himself in a dark habit and a steel corselet he meant to be emperor to-morrow he meant to be faithful to the pope but it was in his heart to see jacobia once more before he accepted the devil's last gift and sign leaving the palace secretly when they all thought him in his chamber he took his way toward the appian gate he gently pushed the convent gate and entered the hot dusk just revealed to him the dim shapes of the white roses and the dark figure of a lady standing beside them jacobia he whispered she moved very slowly towards him ah you jacobia you must not remain in this place where are the nuns she shook her head they are dead of the plague days past and i have buried them in the garden he thought she smiled he followed her into the house the chamber where they had sat before a tall pale candle burnt on the bare table and by the light of it he saw her face she crept with a slow sick movement to a bench that stood against the wall and sank down on it her features showed pinched and wan her eyes unnaturally blue in the pallor of her face you must return to martzburg cried thierry distractedly and thought of her as he had first seen her bright and gay in a pale crimson dress nay i shall return to martzburg no more she answered he died to-day he who died jacobia very faintly she smiled sebastian in palestine god let me see him then because i had never looked on him since that morning on which you saw us sir he has been a holy man fighting the infidel they wounded him i think and he was sick with fever he crept into the shade for it is very hot there sir and died thierry stood dumb and the mad hatred of the devil who brought about this misery anew possessed him jacobia spoke again maybe they have met in paradise and as for me i hope god may think me fit to die of late it seemed to me that the fiends were again troubling me she clasped her hands tightly on her knees and shivered something evil is abroad who is the dancer last night i saw her crouching by my gate as i was making the grave of sister angela and it seemed it seemed that she bewitched me as the young scholar did long ago thierry leant heavily against the table she is the pope's spy and tool he cried hoarsely ursula of rousselary jacobia's dim eyes were bewildered ah baltasar's wife she faltered but the pope's tool how should he meddle with an evil thing then he told her in an outburst of wild unnameable feeling the pope is dirk renswode the pope is antichrist do you not understand and i am to help him rule the kingdom of the devil dirk renswode she muttered and ursula of rousselary why was it not to save hugh of rousselary that he rode that night thierry lifted his head and looked at her her utterance was feeble and confused her eyes glazing in a livid face he clasped his hands tightly over hers what was lord hugh to him she asked ursula's father i do not understand cried thierry but it is very clear to me 
I am dying. She loved you, loves you still, that such things should be. Whom do you speak of, Jacobia? he cried. She drooped towards him, and he caught her in his arms. The city is accursed, she gasped. Give me Christian burial, if ever once you cared for me, and fly, fly! She strained and writhed in his frantic embrace. And you never knew it was a woman, she whispered, pope and dancer. God! shrieked Thierry and staggered to his feet, drawing her with him. She slipped from him to the bench. Water! A crucifix! Oh, I have forgot my prayers! She stretched out her hands towards a wooden crucifix that hung on the wall, caught hold of it, pressed her lips to the feet. Sibylla, she said, and died with that name struggling in her throat. Thierry stepped back from her with a strangled shriek that seemed to tear the breath from his body and staggered against the table. The lightning leapt in through the dark window and appeared to plunge like a sword into the breast of the dead woman. Dead, even as she uttered that horror. Dead, so suddenly. The plague had slain her. He did not wish to die, so he must leave this place. Was he not to be emperor tomorrow? He fell to laughing. He crawled across the room and stared at Jacobia. She was not beautiful. He noticed that her hands were torn and stained with earth from making the graves of the nuns. She had asked for Christian burial. He could not stay to give it to her. He fiercely hated her for what she had told him. Yet he took up the ends of her yellow hair and kissed them. Again the thunder and lightning and wild howlings reached him from without, as ghosts and night hags wandered past to hold court within the accursed city. The candle shot up a long tongue of flame and went out. Thierry staggered across the darkness. A flash of lightning showed him the door. As the thunder crashed above the city, he fled from the convent and from Rome. End of section 32 Recording by Molly Craig Section 33 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2, Chapter 11, The Angels In a ruined villa, shattered by the barbarians and crumbled by time, sat Isabeau the Empress looking over the sunless Maremma. A few olive trees were all that shaded the bare expanse of marshy land, where great pools veiled with unhealthy vapors gleamed faintly under the heavy clouds. Here and there rose the straight roof of a forsaken convent, or the stately pillars of a deserted palace. There was no human being in sight. She had dwelt here for three days. At every sunrise a peasant girl, daring the excommunication, had brought her food, then fled with a frightened face. Isabeau saw nothing before her save death, but she did not mean to die by the ignoble way of starvation. She had not heard of the defeat of Balthasar at Tivoli, nor of the election of Thierry to the crown. Day and night she thought on her husband, and pondered how she still might possibly serve him. She did not hope to see him again. It never occurred to her to return to him. When she had fled his camp, she had left a confession behind her. No Greek would have heeded it. But these Saxons, still to her foreigners, were different, and Balthasar had loved Melchior of Brabant. She moved to the inner portion of the villa, and here she seated herself on the capital of a broken column and a languid weariness subdued her proud spirit. Her head sank back against the stained wall, and she slept. When she woke, the whole landscape was glowing with the soft red of sunset. There were faint voices coming from the outer room, and the sound of a man's tread. For a while she waited, then crept cautiously towards the shattered doorway that led into the other chamber. She gained it and gazed through. Sitting where she had just now sat, under the vine-twisted columns, 
was a huge knight in defaced armour his back was towards her by his side his helmet stood and the great glittering dragon that formed the crest shone in the setting sun he was bending over a child that lay asleep on a crimson cloak balthasar said isabeau he gave a little cry and looked over his shoulder he rose softly his face flushed i am a ruined man they have elected another emperor now i think it does not matter her eyes travelled in a dazed way to the child is he sick nay only weary we have been wandering since tivoli when he spoke he looked at her as if the world held nothing else worth gazing on i must go said isabeau must go i am cast out i may not share your misfortunes balthasar laughed i have been searching for you madly isabeau but you found the writing she cried yea you know i slew him i know you went to give your life for me oh balthasar does it make no difference it cannot he said half sadly you are my wife part of me i have given you my heart to keep and nothing can alter it you do not mock me she questioned shuddering it must be that you mock me i will go away he stepped before her you shall never leave me again isabeau he put his arm round her bowed shoulders her marvellous hair lay across his dinted mail this is sweeter than our marriage day balthasar for now you know the worst of me he set her gently on the broken shaft by the door and kissed her hand and he told her how they had been defeated at tivoli how the remnant of his force had forsaken him and how thierry of dendermonde had been elected emperor by the wishes of the pope her eyes grew fierce at that i have ruined you she said made you a beggar could i have held a throne without you isabeau her fingers trembled in his would i had been a better woman for your sake balthasar his swift bright flush dyed his fair face all i grieve for isabeau is god god she asked wondering if he should not forgive me his blue eyes were troubled and we are cursed and cast out what think you through me you grieve and this is through me nay our destiny is one always only i think of afterwards yet if you are damned as the priest says why i will be so too do not fear balthasar if god will not receive me the little images at constantinople will forgive me if i pray to them again as i did when i was a child they fell on silence again while the red colour of the setting sun deepened and cast a glow over their weary faces and the sleeping figure of wenceslas the vine leaves fluttered from the ancient marble and the wild fowl screamed across the marshes who is this pope that he should hate us so mused isabeau and who thierry of dendermonde that he should be emperor of the west i do not understand it nor do i now isabeau balthasar looked at her greatly care she raised his hand kissed it and no more was said while the mist gathered and thickened over the maremma and the rich hues faded from the sky who is that cried isabeau and pointed across the marshland a figure dark against the mists was running aimlessly wildly to and fro winding his way in and out the pools now and then flinging his arms up in a frantic gesture toward the evening sky a madman said balthasar see he runs with no object round and round yet always as if pursued suddenly as if exhausted the man stopped and stood still with hanging head and arms the sun burning to the horizon made a vivid background to his tall dark figure till the heavy noisome vapours rose to the level of the sunset and the solitary motionless stranger was blotted from the view of the two watching in the ruined villa 
we must get away said balthasar resolutely this is a vile spot the man whispered isabeau out of the dreary vapours the forlorn and foul mists of the marches he appeared stumbling over the stones in his way he caught hold of the slender pillar by the entrance and stared at the three with distraught eyes his clothes were dark wet and soiled his hair hung lank round a face hollow and pale but of obvious beauty thierry of dendermonde exclaimed balthasar isabeau gave a cry that woke the child and sent him frightened into her arms the emperor said the newcomer in a feeble voice balthasar answered fiercely am i still emperor to you you who to-day were to receive my crown in st peter's church thierry shivered and crouched like one very cold of my own will i fled from rome that city of the devil balthasar stared at him you are the emperor said thierry faintly and i pretend no longer to these wrongful honours nor serve i any longer antichrist he is mad cried balthasar nay isabeau spoke eagerly listen to him thierry moaned i have nothing to say give me a place to rest in through you we have no place ourselves to rest in answered balthasar grimly no shelter save these broken walls you see but since you have returned to your allegiance we command that you tell us of this antichrist thierry straightened himself he who reigns in rome is antichrist michael who was dirk renswode he perished said the emperor very pale and the pope was blay of dendermonde that was the devil's work black magic cried thierry wildly the youth blay died ten years ago and dirk renswode took his place it is true cried the empress by what he said to me i know it true now do i see it very clearly then thierry began to speak he told them in a thick expressionless voice all he knew of dirk renswode he did not mention ursula of rousselary as his tale went on the storm gathered till all light had vanished from the sky the lightning rent a starless gloom thierry's voice suddenly strengthened now turn against rome for all men will join you a force of lombards marches up from trastever and the saxons gather without the walls of the accursed city a blue flash showed them his face they heard him fall after a while balthasar made his way to him through the dark he has fainted he said fearfully is he belike mad he speaks the hideous truth whispered isabeau suddenly at its very height the storm ceased the air became cool and fragrant and a bright moon floated from the clouds the first moon and stars that had shone since michael the second's reign in the vatican balthasar looked at his wife neither dared to speak but wenceslas gave a panting sigh of relief at the lifting of the darkness my lord he said striving out of his mother's arms a goodly company comes across the marsh a great awe and fear held them silent and the wonderful silver shine of the moon lay over them like a spell they saw slowly approaching them two knights and two ladies who seemed to advance without motion across the marshland the knights wore armor that shone like glass and long mantles of white samite the dames were clad in silver tissue and around their brows were close pressed wreaths of roses mingled red and white they paused balthasar drew back before the great light they brought with them and isabeau hid her face for some of them she knew on earth their names had been melchoir sebastian jacobia and sibylla balthasar said the foremost knight we are come from the courts of paradise to bid you march against rome in that city reigns evil permitted to punish a sinful people but now her time is come go you to viterbo there you will find the cardinal of narbonne whom god has ordained pope and with him an army 
at the head of it storm rome and all the people shall join you in destroying antichrist balthasar fell on his knees and the curse he cried tis not the curse of god upon you therefore be comforted balthasar of courtraig and at the dawn haste to viterbo with that they moved away and were absorbed into the silver light that transfigured the maremma balthasar sprang to his feet shouting i am not excommunicate i shall be emperor again the curse is lifted balthasar caught thierry by the shoulder did you see the vision the angels thierry came shuddering from his swoon i saw nothing ursula ursula End of section 33. Recording by Molly Craig. Section 34 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2. Chapter 12. In the Vatican. In the ebony cabinet in the Vatican sat Michael II. An expression of utter anguish marked his face. Paolo Orsini entered. The Pope glanced at him without moving. No news, he asked. None of the Lord Thierry, your holiness. Michael II moistened his lips. They have searched everywhere? Throughout Rome, your holiness. But he was armed, they said, when he left the palace. Have you sent to the convent I told you of, St. Angela, beyond the Appian Gate? Yea, your holiness, answered Orsini and they found naught but a dead woman. The Pope averted his eyes. What did they with her? Orsini lifted his brows. Cast her into the plague pit, holiness. That quarter is a carnal house. The Pope drew a deep breath. Well, he is gone. I do not think him dead. He flung back his head. But the game is over, is it not, Orsini? We fling down our pieces and say, Good night. His nostrils dilated, his eyes flashed. He brought his open hand softly on to the table. What does your holiness mean? asked Orsini. We mean that this puppet emperor of ours has forsaken us, and that our position becomes perilous, answered the Pope. Cardinal Narbonne, hurling defiance at us from Viterbo, grows stronger, and the mob. Do not seek to deceive me, Orsini the mob clamors against us it is true my lord the pope gave a terrible smile and his beautiful eyes widened and the soldiers mutiny the saxons at trestever have joined balthasar and the Vernays have left me we have not enough men to hold rome an hour well orsini you shall take a summons to the cardinals and we will hold a conclave there to decide how we may meet our fortune the secretary departed in silence. Mutterings, murmurings, howlings rose from the accursed city to the pontiff's chamber. Lightning darted from the black heavens, and thunder rolled round the hills of Rome. Michael II walked to and fro in his gorgeous cabinet. In the three days since Thierry had fled the city, his power had crumbled like a handful of sand. Rome had turned against him, and every hour men fell away from his cause. The devils, too, had forsaken him. He could not raise the spirits. The magic fires would not burn. All was blank darkness and silence. The day wore on, and the storm grew in violence. Paolo Orsini came again to him, his face pale. Half the cardinals are fled to Viterbo, and those remaining refuse to acknowledge your holiness. The Pope smiled. I had expected it. News comes from a Greek runner that Thierry of Dendermonde is with Balthasar's host. Also, I expected that, said Michael II wildly. And they proclaim you, continued Orsini, in an agitated manner, an impostor, one given to evil practices, and by these means incite the people against you. Cardinal Orvieto has led a thousand men across the marshes to the Emperor's army. And Thierry of Dendermonde has denounced me, said the Pope. As he spoke, one beat for admission on the gilt door. The secretary opened, 
and there entered an eastern chamberlain. Holiness, he cried fearfully, the people have set fire to your palace on the Palatine Hill, and Cardinal Colonna, with his brother Octavian, have seized Castel San Angelo for the emperor, and hold it in defiance of your grace. The captain of my guard, and those faithful to me, answered the pope, will know how to do what may be done. Apprise me of the approach of Balthasar's host, and now go. They left him. He stood for a while, listening to those ominous sounds that filled the murky air. Then he pressed a spring in one of the mother-of-pearl panels and stepped into the secret chamber that was revealed. Cautiously he closed the panel by which he had entered and looked furtively about him. The small windowless space was lit only by one blood-red lamp. Locked cupboards lined the walls and a huge globe of faint gold painted with curious and mystic symbols hung from the ceiling. The Pope's stiff garments made a soft rustling sound as he moved. His quick, desperate breathing disturbed the heavy, confined air. In his pallid face his eyes rolled and gleamed. Satanus! Satanus! he muttered. Is this the end? A throbbing shook the red-lit gloom. His last words were echoed mournfully. The end. The Pope glared in front of him. Must I die, Satanus? Must I swiftly die? A little confused laughter came before the echo. Swiftly die. He paced up and down the narrow space. I staked my fortunes on that man's faith, and he has forsaken me, and I have lost, 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 lost. The Pope laughed frantically. At least she died, Satanus. Her yellow hair rots in the plague pit now. I had some skill left, but what was all my skill if I could not keep him faithful to me? He clasped his jeweled hands over his eyes. Utter silence followed his words now. The globe of pallid gold trembled in the darkness of the domed ceiling, and the mystic characters on it began to writhe and move. Ye warned me, breathed the Pope, that this man would be my bane. You promised on his truth to you and me to have the world between us. He was false, and you have utterly forsaken me? The echo answered, Utterly forsaken? The lamp went out. The pale luminous globe expanded to a monstrous size. The circle of dark little fiends round it danced and whirled madly. Then it burst and fell in a thousand fragments at the Pope's feet. Out of the darkness came a wail as of some thing hurt or dying. Then long sighing shook the close air. The Pope fell along the wall, touched the spring, and stepped into the ebony cabinet. He looked quite old and small and bowed. Night had fallen. He sank into a chair and folded his hands in his lap. His head fell forward on his breast, his lips quivered, and two tears rolled down his cheeks. The Angelus bells rang out over the city. There were not many to ring now. As they quivered away, a clock struck quite near. The Pope did not move. Once again, Paolo Orsini entered, and Michael II averted his face. Holiness! Balthasar marches on Rome, said the secretary. The mob rushed forth to join him, and if the gates were brass, and five times brass, the Vatican could not withstand them. Now the Pope turned his white face. What may I do? The captain of the guard suggests that ye come to terms with the emperor, and by submission save your life. That I will not. Then it were well if your holiness would flee. There is a secret way out of the Vatican." and that I will not. Orsini, too, was very pale. Then you are doomed to fall into the hands of Balthasar, and he and his faction say horrible things. The Pope rose. You think they would lay hands on me? I do fear it. It would be a shameful death, Orsini? Surely not that. I cannot think the Emperor would do more than imprison your holiness. The Pope went to the window. How they howl, he said through his teeth. 
and Balthasar comes nearer, nearer. He checked himself abruptly. I will dine here tonight, Orsini. See that everything is done as usual. The secretary bowed himself out of the gilt door. Michael the second went to the table on the dais and took from it a scroll of parchment. Standing in the center of the room, he unrolled it. Some verses were written in scarlet ink on the smooth surface. In a low voice, he read aloud, The two last. If love were all, I had lived glad and meek, nor heard ambition call and valor speak. If love were all, he smiled bitterly. But love is weak and often leaves his throne among his scattered roses pale to weep and moan. And I, apostate to his whispered creed, shall miss his wings above my pall, nor find his face in this my bitter need, when love is all. He tore the parchments into fragments and scattered them on the floor. Again the gilt doors were open. This time a chamberlain entered. A herald had brought a fierce and grim message from Balthasar. It spoke of the Pope as Antichrist and called on him to submit if he would keep his life. The Pope read it with haughty eyes. When he had finished, he rented a cross and cast the pieces down among the others. And ye shall hang the herald, he said. We have so much authority. The Chamberlain handed him a second packet, sealed, from Thierry of Dendermonde. The Pope took the packet. Let the herald live, he said, but cast him into the dungeons. The Chamberlain withdrew. For a while Michael the Second stood staring at the packet while the thunder crashed over Rome. Then he slowly broke the seal. He unfolded the long strip of vellum and went nearer the candles to read it. Thus it ran. The Emperor's camp, marching on Rome, Thierry of Dendermonde, to Michael, Pope of Rome. Thus. I am approaching madness. I cannot sleep or rest. After days of torment, I write to you whom I have twice betrayed. She died on my breast, but I do not care. Balthasar says he saw her walking on the Maremma, but I saw nothing. Before she died, she said something. I think of you, and of nothing else, though I have betrayed you. I have never uttered what she said. No one guesses. The uncertainty... The horror gnaw away at my heart, so I write this to you. This is my message. If you are a devil, be satisfied, for your devil's work is done. If you are a man, you have befriended, wronged me, and I have avenged myself. If you are that other thing you may be, then I know you love me, and that I kissed you once. If this last be true, as I do think it true, have some pity on my long ignorance, and believe I have it in me to love, even as you have loved. O oh, Ursula, I know a city in India where we might live, and you forget you ever ruled in Rome. Yonder are other gods who are so old they have forgot to punish, and they would smile on you and me there. Ursula, Balthasar marches on the city, and you must be ruined and discovered, brought to an end so horrible. You have showed me a secret way out of the Vatican. Use it now, this night. I am in advance of the host. I shall be without the Appian Gate tonight, and I have means whereby we may fly to the coast and there take ship to India. Until we meet, farewell. And in the name of all the passions, you have roused in me. Come. As the Pope read, all the color slowly left his face. When he had finished, he mechanically rolled up the parchment, then unrolled it again. Thunder shook the Vatican, and the mob howled without. Again he read the letter. Then he thrust it into one of the candles and watched it blacken, curl, and burst into flame. He flung it on the marble floor, and set his gold heel on it, grinding it into ashes. At the usual hour, 
they served his sumptuous supper when it was finished and removed paolo orsini came again will not your holiness fly before it is too late all traces of anguish and woe had vanished from his master's features he looked proud and beautiful i shall stay here but let them who will seek safety he dismissed orsini and the attendants it was now late in the evening and the thunder unceasing the pope locked the door of the cabinet then went to the gilt table and wrote a letter rapidly this he folded sealed with purple wax and stamped with his great thumb ring he sat silent a little while after this and stared with great luminous eyes before him then roused himself and unlocked a drawer in the table from this he took some documents tied together with orange silk and a ring with a red stone in it one by one he burnt the parchments in the candle and when they were reduced to a little pile of ashes he cast the ring into the midst of it and turned away he crossed to the window drew the curtains and looked out over rome in the black heavens above the black hills hung a huge meteor a blazing globe of fire with a trail of flame he took up one of the candles and went to the gold door that led to his bedchamber before he opened it he paused a moment the candle flame lit his vivid eyes his haughty face his glittering vestments he turned the handle and entered the dark spacious room through the high undraped window could clearly be seen the star that seemed to burn away the very sky the pope set the candle on a shelf where it showed dim glimpses of white and gold tapestries walls of alabaster a bed of purple and gilt mysterious gorgeous luxury he returned to the cabinet and took from the bosom of his gown a little bottle of yellow jade for the stopper a ruby served the thunder crashed deafeningly the lightning seemed to split the room in twain the pope stood still listening then he blew out the candles and returned to his bedchamber softly he passed into the scented splendid chamber and closed the door behind him end of section 34 recording by molly craig Section 35 of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2, Chapter 13 The Secret. The mob had stormed the Vatican. Octavian Colonna, with a handful of fighting men, ascended the undefended marble staircase. The papal guards lay slain in the courtyard, and in the entrance hall, chamberlains, secretary, pages and priests fled or surrendered with the lord colonna was thierry of dendermonde who had entered rome that morning by the appian gate and headed a faction of the lawless crowd in their wild attack on the vatican to himself he kept saying i shall know she did not come i shall know she did not come it was early morning the terrific storm of last night still lingered over Rome. Flashes of blue light divided the murky clouds, and the thunder hung about the Aventine. The Colonna grew afraid. He waited below in the gorgeous audience chamber, and sent up to the Pope's apartments, demanding his submission and promising him safety. The overawed crowd retired into the courtyard and the piazza while Paolo Orsini ascended the silver stairs. He returned with this message. His holiness's apartments were locked, nor could they make him hear. It was a common thought among the knights that Michael II had escaped. A monk offered to show them the secret passage where his holiness might be even now. Many went but thierry followed the attendants to the gilt door of the ebony cabinet they broke the lock and entered fearfully on the floor torn fragments of parchments a pile of ashes with a ruby ring lying in the midst nothing else his holiness is in his chamber we dare not enter they had always been afraid of him 
even now his name held terror the colonna waits our news cried thierry wildly i i dare enter they tiptoed to the other gilt door it took them some time to remove the lock when at last the door gave and swung open they shrunk away but thierry passed into the chamber the sombre light of dawn filled it heavy shadows obscured the rich splendors of golden colors of gleaming white walls the men crept after him it seemed to thierry as if the world had stopped about them on the magnificent purple bed lay the pope on his brow the tiara glittered and on his breast the chasuble the crozier lay by his side on the samite coverlet and his feet glittered in their golden shoes by the crozier was a letter and a jade bottle the attendants shrieked and fled thierry crept to the bedside and took up the parchment his name was over the top he broke the seal he read the fair writing if i be a devil i go whence i came if a man i lived as one and died as one if a woman i have known love conquered it and by it have been vanquished whatsoever i am i perish on the heights but i do not descend from them i have known things in their fullness and will not stay to taste the dregs so to you greeting and not for long farewell the letter fell from thierry's hand fluttered and sank to the floor he raised his eyes and saw through the window the meteor blazing over rome dead he looked now at the proud smooth face on the pillow the gems of the papal crown gleaming above the red locks the jeweled chasubles sparkling in the strengthening dawn until he was nearly fooled into thinking the bosom heaved beneath he was alone at least he could know the air was like incense sweet and stifling his blood seemed to beat in his brain with a little foolish sound of melody a shaft of gray light fell over the splendors of the bed the roses and dragons hawks and hounds sewn on the curtains and coverlets from the pope's garments rose a subtle and beautiful perfume ursula said thierry he bent over the bed until the pearls in his ears touched his cheeks without the thunder muttered to know he lifted the dead pope's arm there seemed to be neither weight nor substance under the stiff silk he dropped the sleeve his cold fingers unclasped the heavy chasuble underneath lay perfumed samite white and soft an awful sensation crept through his veins he thought that under these gorgeous vestments was nothing nothing ashes he did not dare to uncover the bosom that lay that must lie under the gleaming samite but he must know he lifted up the fair crowned head to peer madly into the proud features it came away in his hands like crumbling wood that may preserve till touched the semblance of the carving so the pope's head parted from the trunk thierry smiled with horror and stared at what he held then it disappeared fell into ashes before his eyes and the tiara rolled on to the floor gone like an image of smoke he sank across the headless thing on the bed must i follow you to know follow you to hell he whispered now he could open the rich garments they were empty of all save dust the strange strong perfume was stinging and numbing his brain his heart he thought he heard the fiends coming for his soul at last he hid his face in the purple silk robes and felt his blood grow cold the room darkened about him he knew he was being drawn downwards into eternity he sighed and slipped from the bed on to the floor as his last breath hovered on his lips the meteor vanished the thunderclouds rolled away from a fair blue sky and a glorious sunrise laughed over the city the reign of the antichrist was ended through the pope's chamber the notes of silver trumpets quivered 
Balthasar's trumpets as his hosts march triumphantly into Rome. End of section 35. Recording by Molly Craig. End of Black Magic by Marjorie Bowen.